thanks uh, thanks for what the invitation to speak here and thanks for everyone joining either here in Montreal or, or online. So the talk is uh, about some joint work with Roger Bielowski and sort of it's basically two parts. Uh, one that I'll surely manage to discuss, um, which is about sort of, um, it's based on a, on a paper that's an archive since the beginning of the year. And uh, the second part, or what well, I'll manage to say about it, it's more sort of a report on work in progress. Um, sort of, but the two parts are sort of related by kind of the theme, which is about um, extending, uh, there's a, a bit of echo in the room, maybe there's some. Okay, we'll sort in that out. So the, the common theme is to generalize to, or try to think about high dimensional habitat geometries that generalize the, the geometry of uh, uh, gravita four dimensional gravitational instantons. So um, complete non-compact habitat for manifolds with decaying curvature. And uh, sort of these are um, kind of relatively uh, well known, at least the first items in the sort of uh, list. Uh, so the, the gravitational instanton in dimension four, they're grouped into different families depending on their kind of volume growth and, uh, and uh, uh, asymptotic behavior. Um, the uh, most uh, well-known case is the case of ALE spaces, so asymptotically locally Euclidean metrics. So these are hypercalent metrics that are uh, asymptotic at infinity to flat uh, C2 mod gamma, where gamma is a finite subgroup of SU2. And they were all constructed and classified by Cronheimer in 1989. And then uh, sort of uh, kind of hierarchy based on uh, kind of collapsing at infinity. Uh, the second class is the class of ALF spaces. ALF stands for asymptotically locally flat. Um, so these are also known, I mean, examples of these are known since a long time, uh, kind of some examples written by the gibbons walking ansatz from the late 70s. So, but the kind of uh, classifications are much more recent, uh, sort of one subfamily was classified by Minerb 2011, and the full classification of ALF spaces due to uh, Xu Shan Chen and Gao Chen as part of their classification of gravitational instant on this faster than quadratic curvature decay. So the, the uh, asymptotic geometry is described like this. So we now have sort of uh, cubic volume growth. So the volume of a ball of radius R grows like R to the cube uh, instead of R to the four. Um, and uh, sort of at infinity up to that ball cover, we have a, uh, the metric is approximated by Riemannian submersion where the base is flat R3 and the fibers are circles of some fixed finite length. Uh, and then there's uh, various additional families that are more and more collapsed at infinity um, for these, uh, for those um, um, kind of, we know a lot, there's partial uh, classification results, lots of different construction um, and a coming one by my students, Andrew Sal, who's here. Um, but okay, but today I'll focus on these two classes, ALE and ALF, and sort of what high dimensional abacalic geometries that sort of have some similar features to these in high dimension would, would look like. And uh, sort of various motivations for this. So um, I guess one chief motivation to study non-compact uh, sort of uh, Ricci flat metrics or uh, metric with special autonomy is that there will appear a sort of rescale limits uh, when you study the generated sequence of uh, Einstein metrics or special holonomy metrics on compact manifolds. Um, in this particular Habekele case, actually there's a long also story and interesting story about sort of relation of how kind of non-compact Habekele manifolds arise as modulized spaces in gauge theory, um, both in a classical 
sense and also more recently as uh, modular spaces of vacuo quantum gauge theory. And through this, there's connection with geometric representation theories and various other bits of mathematics. Okay, so the uh, first part is going to be about um, hyperkalin metrics with uh, uh, kind of Euclidean uh, volume growth. So uh, start look at a four n dimensional manifold, a Riemannian manifolds, which is hyperkalin. So there's a triple of complex structures, J1, J2, J3, and corresponding triple of Keller forms, omega one, omega two, omega three, uh, that compatible in appropriate sense. Uh, the metric is then automatically Ricci flat, and therefore, kind of in the complete case, we have um, uh, kind of Bishop Grom volume comparison that constrains the uh, how the volumes of uh, geodesic balls of radius R behaves. It must uh, grow uh, as a polynomial in R, at least linearly, and at most like the uh, behavior of balls in R. 4L, the same as the dimension. So, so we say we have a metric of maximal volume growth when we realize this uh, maximal uh, possible uh, rate of growth. And then one uh, uh, kind of first things that you want is of course, it's not specifying much about the asymptotic geometry, but the first things that you want to look at is the notion of a tangent cone at infinity. So you take a, a sequence of scale parameters going to zero, you kind of blow down the matrix, and then again, because of uh, volume comparison, growing of the compactness theorem, you can extract uh, after a such sequence a uh, uh, limit in the pointed chroma of uh, topology that you call the uh, at tangent cone at infinity for your metric. And then of course, a first sort of regularity questions is whether tangent cones are unique or not. And uh, in this other kind of case, that's the case. And this follows from uh, work of Donaldson and Soon, uh, well, description of tangent cones in color geometry. So, uh, so this, this tangent cone at infinity of a complete hypercalor metric is going to be, so it's, it's unique. And in any complex structure, sort of can make sense of it as a, the complex geometric object as a normal fine variety, and the regular parts of this normal fine variety is going to carry a hypercalor cone metric. So the simple situation is where you have an isolated singularity for this cone. So you have a Riemannian cone over a, a smooth, closed, uh, Trisovakian manifold, sigma. Then you would say that. Uh, um, Kind of if you have a complete metric asymptotic to this, then kind of you, you are in the uh, sort of context of asymptotically conical uh, uh, metrics. Right, right. Yes, it does in this uh, maximum volume growth case. Correct. Yes, I should have said that. Um, Right, so. Um, Sorry, we don't pick up the room mic, so uh, I didn't know what the question was. Uh, uh, sure this answered. Isn't. So, uh, Marco was asking whether, um, I mean, he was making the right remark that I should have made that this, in, when you have this maximal volume growth assumption, then this tangent cone has the same dimension as the, as the, as the manifold, this tangent cone at infinity has the same dimension of the mind. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, um, right. Um, so one thing that will be useful for later is to actually describe uh, some property of this um, tangent cone um, uh, kind of in the sort of complex geometric sense. So said this is a normal affine variety. Um, I mean, of course the regular, I mean, you can do this for any complex structure in the hypercalor triple, that they're on a cone, they're all equivalent because of the um, sort of SO3, uh, SU2 or SO3 action on the Trisovaki that rotates the complex structures of the cone. So, um, but basically, 
kind of work of Vancouver and Namikawa actually says that, um, at least in the case where the cone is as an isolated singularity, you can actually say, kind of describe a bit more of the properties of the cone in a, in a given complex structure. So, so we're fixing a complex structure, say J1, something. Uh, say we fix complex structure J1. Um, so we have this normal fine variety. Uh, we can, there's a natural holomorphic uh, symplectic form obtained by combining D omega two and omega three. And uh, there's a distinguished point, which is the vertex of the, of the cone and uh, sort of as a, a fine variety, this is a, a symplectic singularity um, where here, what I mean, I mean, there's a definition due to Beauville uh, in 2000 of a symplectic singularity. Basically you look at a resolution of singularity and you pull back the uh, holomorphic symplectic form on the regular part of the cone. And what you ask is that uh, upon the resolution, this extends as a holomorphic twofold, not necessarily non degenerate. So, so, this is a definition that's modeled as the definition of a rational singularity in algebraic geometry that Bobby gave in 2000. So, so you can show that, uh, that any kind of other kind of cone with an isolated singularity is a sympathetic singularity in this sense. Um, on the cone, of course, we have the R plus scaling action. And because three Sasaki manifolds are quasi regular in any compatible Sasaki Einstein structure, actually, this R plus action complexifies to a sister action. And this is going to act on the holomorphic symplectic form with weight either one or two, uh, very often one. So let me assume that. That's because this is, I mean, the S1 in this C star is actually an S1 inside this SU2 action that rotates the um, uh, Hadokele triple on the cone. And then in the fixed complex structure, sort of the remnant of the full SU2 action, I guess, is this S1, but also the, well, is really kind of the normalizer of a, of a U1 inside, inside SU2, right? So you have the U1 of holomorphic. Uh, kind of isometries, but then there's a, a kind of the action of J, which is a real uh, involution. So it's an anti-homorphic, anti-symplectic um, uh, isometry of the, of, of the cone. Okay, good. So, so uh, right, so these are properties that one can deduce when we start with an isolated singularity, um, but in general, these hypercalic cones, they're going to have uh, most often than not, they're going to be uh, going to have uh, non-isolated singularities. Um, so here's there's, uh, but there's still lots of interesting examples. Here's just uh, three classes. Um, so uh, well, you can take cones that are just uh, finite quotients of a flat space by a finite subgroup of SPN. These are never isolated singularities in higher dimensions, and. Um, Sort of, if you think about complete hypercalic metrics that are asymptotic, that have tangent cone at infinity, one of these finite quotients, then this, since the tangent cone at infinity is actually flat in this case, then these are metrics that fall in the class of quasi ALE metric, QALE metric that uh, were constructed by Dominic Joyce using complex branch of pair methods uh, adapted to this QALE asymptotic geometry. But this is basically, I think, since kind of working analytically on manifolds with a tangent cone that has non isolated singularity is quite challenging. Um, so basically, I think this is the only analytic constructions of uh, complete hypercalic metrics with non, non uh, kind of not smooth tangent cone. Uh, Sure, you, you would have, uh, I mean, right. So, 
Yeah, I, 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 the Cato. I mean, um, so we have the absence, absence of criticism. Give it a, a, a sort of pause. Right. I have to say that probably, I mean, the expectation, I think, is that there's not very many asymptotics. I mean, the only one should be Calabi's metric on the tangent bundle of Pn, the only asymptotic coin call at the Pn metrics in the higher dimension. So, um, right. OK. Um, right, so then uh, two other interesting classes. So one, I mean, one nice way of getting lots of interesting habakkuk cones is by taking habakkuk quotients of uh, flat space by a group of trilomorphic isometries. But if you take level zero, uh, then the result is going to be uh, a cone again. And then by varying the level set of the moment map, you get sort of partial uh, habakkuk smoothings or um, desingularization, say, of, uh, of, the, of the code. So, for example, in this class, you have the Nakajima Spiro varieties are framed like this, or habitoric varieties that uh, is going to appear later if I get there. Um, right, and then another class is uh, sort of you look at the uh, nilpotent cone of a, say, simple complex D algebra GC um, and kind of uh, as smooth, uh, complete apical metrics are synthetic to it. Uh, so for apical metrics on quad joint, complex quad joint orbits, the Lie algebra. So uh, here, all these apical metrics are constructed by apical quotients in infinite dimensionals by sort of this moduli spaces in gauge theory, uh, moduli spaces of Nam's equation. And this is work of Kronheimer, and then um, more general case done by Descartes and Kovalev. Okay, so, um, right, so, um, okay, so with Roger, uh, what we, um, um, uh, okay, so what we did is basically realizing that uh, there's a, one can combine uh, results about deformation theory in complex geometry of uh, um, isolated affine, um, isolated um, symplectic singularities with twisted methods to obtain sort of for free uh, large families of uh, habakkuk metrics with sort of tangent cone X. So basically this is essentially the Hitchens twisted constructions of, uh, um, uh, I mean, when back in the seventies, Hitchens was constructing uh, ALE uh, metrics for kind of C2 mod ZN. Uh, basically, essentially, I mean, it discovered this very close relationship between uh, the existence of this Habakkara, ALE Habakkara metrics and the kind of deformation theory of Duval singularities then exploded by Kronheimer. And well, basically we find that there's a very analogous story in high dimensions. And maybe also a closely related work is uh, uh, Hitchens students, Damarin Santa Cruz, who had a twister approach to uh, Habakkara metrics on complex quad joint orbits. Uh, but he because he wasn't able to prove that the metric is uh, positive definite. So it has a, but uh, I mean, our, essentially our main observations is that uh, the construction of works for any uh, symplectic singularity and from the deformation theory, you also automatically get the positive definiteness. Okay, so, so we start sort of now from a kind of ideally an arbitrary hyperkele cone, uh, but uh, I mean, when the singularity is not isolated, I don't really know what this is. I mean, the regular part is a cone, fine, but as a global object, I'm not sure. So I'm actually going to start with the kind of complex geometry assumptions that were verified in the um, isolated singularity case. And I'll uh, postulate them as a uh, end of my definition, even though probably one can check that satisfies. So we have a um, this. Symplectic singularity in the sense of uh, Boville uh, with a homeomorphic symplectic form, this sister action that constructs everything onto the vertex, attacks with, uh, oh, I didn't say before. So good sister action means that the action on the 
Cordelian rings as positive weights. Um, and in fact, we weight one on the holomorphism platform, and we also have this compatible real structure. And then the re in, moreover, the regular part carries a hypercardial cone metric. Okay, so that's, that's uh, we start with something like this. And now let's forget for a moment the uh, cone metric and just look at the uh, kind of complex data. And uh, uh, what we want to apply is this uh, theory by Namikawa about uh, Poisson deformations of uh, these are uh, symplectic singularity. So the point is that um, kind of deformation theory of singular varieties when the singularities are not isolated is not in general well behaved. But the uh, point of uh, this Namikawa's work is that within this uh, sort of symplectic, holomorphic symplectic category, then you have a very good uh, deformation theory. So, more precisely, uh, what it does, it constructs um, a fine uh, uh, variety, uh, curly X, uh, which is a holomorphic Poisson uh, variety. So, the coordinate ring has a holomorphic Poisson structure. Um, there's a flat morphism down to an affine space of some finite dimension, Pr. The fiber of this projection are precisely the symplectic leaves of the holomorphic Poisson structure. So the uh, kind of Poisson structure is non-degenerate on the tangent to the fibers of pi. There's a kind of sister action that makes the projection sister equivariant and kind of over the origin in the base, you have X together with its structures uh, induced from the structure on, on curly X. And then since the deformation is universal, you can, kind of, there's a little addendum that brings in the real structure, meaning also the real structure extends to the, to the whole family. Um, okay, good. Um, yeah. No, but well, I call it TX because this is like the, well, it's the deformation space of the affine singularity X. So yeah, it's the tangent phase to this modulus. Oh, I see. Yeah, good point. Good point, Claude. Yeah, okay. Sorry, can you repeat that for the yeah, online people? Definitely it's non-trivial on the base. Uh -huh. Oh, that's, that's true. Yeah. Just wondering what the uh, weights of the C star action are on the base. Right, so the weights, they're going to be uh, some weights down on the base that are part of the data. I don't think, um, I mean, in examples, of course, they'll come out naturally, and I'll show you a few examples, but um, I'm not sure what there's a... So uh, TX is defined as a cohomology group, or? It is the, right, so it is the cohomology of the second com complex, second cohomology complex coefficients of uh, Q factorial terminalization of X. Not, a, not, not H1, it's H2. H2, mm. yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll later on I'll a remark when there's a symplectic resolution, and then that's just the cohomology of the symplectic resolution, and actually that's probably the most interesting case. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, sort of start with this and uh, go to Twister theory. So um, I have some charts yesterday, uh, likely for me, told you a little bit about Twister spaces of uh, Habakkara manifolds. Um, so you have these vibrations over P1 that have very special properties. So um, what we can do here is basically use the sister action to fiber everything over P1. So we sort of twist 
we twist this picture by the uh, holomorphic principle of system bundle over P1 uh, associated with the line bundle O2. I mean, this, this is just a fancy way of uh, just uh, continuing to standard trivialization of P1 with two affine open cover and then transition functions uh, coming from the sister action uh, defined using the sister action and kind of but with weight two. And the weight two is just because I'm for fixing idea assuming that the sister action on the holomorphic in black form has weight one. Okay, so now this picture now is uh, sort of, you have over P1, you have this uh, space curly X2 uh, with this sort of uh, projection down to a holomorphic back to bundle over P1, which is a sum of line bundles of even degrees. And this DI are precisely these uh, weights of this interaction on Namikawa's uh, deformation space. Um, Right, so, so this is not yet our twister space. To get a twister space, basically we want to uh, kind of select um, uh, holomorphic leaves in each, over, over each point in P1, um, we have a copy of uh, curly X and for a twister space, we need the fibers to be holomorphic symplectic manifolds. So we go and need a way to select uh, uh, kind of a, for every point of P1, uh, uh, holomorphic leaf, uh, uh, Symplectic leaf of uh, of curly X, the fiber curly X over that point. So and we do that by uh, fixing uh, uh, kind of a holomorphic section of this holomorphic bundle, uh, which uh, sort of there was this sort of this real structure, and we asked for the section to be uh, real. I mean. Um, Z2 equivariant where Z2 acts on the fibers sent by this real structures and on P1 by the antipodal map. Okay, and I think maybe sometimes we decide that we'll call this data of S as a spectral curve. Okay, and then, and then you sort of look over each point of P1, you have a way of selecting a, a Holomorphic uh, leaf inside curly X. Maybe to avoid any complication, let's take the regular part of everything, just the smooth locus. And this is going to be our twister space. Um, so, so it's a happy twister space, meaning it's a um, holomorphic uh, complex manifold with a holomorphic projection to P1. Uh, there's a um, Holomorphic section of uh, kind of a twisted um, sort of O2 twisted holomorphic symplectic form, kind of two form, the restrict plus symplectic form on each fiber. And there's a real structure that lifts the antipodal map from P1 and everything compatible. Okay, so uh, now, so why, so in this, in this um, as Char was uh, describing yesterday, so this in this twist of construction of Habakkuk metrics, now this is not the end of the story. What you need to get a Habakkuk metric is uh, twist of lines. Right? So, um, so a twist of line is going to be a holomorphic section of this vibration, uh, which is uh, real in the sense uh, that to, Equivalent with respect to this natural depth to action given by the real structures. And the normal bundle of the section must be a sum of O1s. So, main consequence of this uh, assumption is that uh, you can now consider a modular space of such twisted line, and that's a smooth uh, manifold of dimensional multiple of four. And the main theorem of uh, 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 Hitchin, Carlede, Lindstrom, and Rochat study of uh, twister spaces for Habakkuk manifolds is that uh, every such component of this modular space of twister line automatically carries a Habakkuk structure. Uh, but I mean, in general, this is a pseudo Habakkuk structure. It's a non degenerate Habakkuk matrix, but it's not clear what the signature is. So 
to actually get our positive definite hyperkinetic matrix, we need to prove that, uh, well, there's some non empty component of the space of crystal lines of this crystal space that has for which the signature of the hyperkinetic matrix is positive definite. Okay, and that's really the uh, new remark. That, that's right, and that's that's so so Claude uh, stood up while was also mentioning that. Uh, sure. Then, kind of the next step would be to study completeness of of this metric, but that uh, I mean it seems really very hard and almost completely out of reach from from this, this uh, description. And in fact, I'll kind of stop stop there and only say what I think the answer is going to be. But, uh, okay, so. Um, so, but how, how do you produce this non empty component of sort of positive definite component of uh, crystal lines? It's again really the formation theory. So, um, so let me try to explain it with this picture. So, uh, so this is a representation of my cone X, which has non isolated singularities represented by this red sort of lane ray going up to infinity. Now, the point that this in this family of twister space, Z0 is precisely the twister space of this, uh, the Hadokala cone metric on the regular part of X. So by assumption, uh, every point of the regular part of the cone corresponds to a twister lines of Z0. So there's a component of the space of twister line of the zero, which is not empty and for which the metric is positive definite. Right? And all we actually check is that these crystal lines are sort of smooth points in the moduli space of uh, sections of this larger family of crystal spaces. And also there are points where this projection at the level of sections is a homomorphic submersion. So basically, um, uh, if S is sufficiently small, uh, this uh, crystal line in Z0 deforms to a crystal line on for ZS, and that component is going to be positive definite. And then you can use the sister action to say that once you have a point, you actually have the whole ray starting from it. So actually what you produce, you sort of produce hyperkeller metrics that are defined sort of a list on sort of domains in the regular part of the cone that leave out the singular things, but they go all the way off to infinity. So, right, so you, you kind of prove existence of some hyperkeller metrics, but uh, uh, yeah, you really would like to show that they're complete, but uh, that's uh, kind of very far from achieving this, but I'll tell you what I think the answer uh, when, when that's the case. Um, so suppose that uh, your um, uh, sort of, Symplectic singularity X as a symplectic resolution. So this means a resolution of singularities such that the pullback of the holomorphic symplectic form actually extends to a holomorphic symplectic form. Then uh, basically the Minakawa deformation theory uh, extends to a deformation theory for the symplectic resolution and everything fits into a very nice uh, diagram like this. So there's a uh, universal Poisson deformations for the uh, resolution that sort of the deformation space is just the second cohomology, the complex coefficient of X tilde. And there's a, a finite group, a finite reflection group acting linearly on this cohomology. And the quotient, which is still a smooth affine space, is precisely the deformation space of the singularity X. And everything fits into a diagram, the sister action, et cetera. So basically, right. There was one question. Right. So, uh, right. So basically, what you, I think the answer should be is that when sort of your spectral curve actually arises from a kind of spectral curve up here that's sufficiently generic, then you would expect to get complete hypercalic metric on X tilde that are have access standing cone at infinity. So, um, and you actually would have also some sort of uh, Torelli theorem here where this metric would be parameterized by triple of cohomology classes. 
on, on X tilde. Okay, so I think I don't think I will ever be able to prove this, but uh, um, <laughs> so um, I think it was saying though. Okay, so let me just discuss a couple of examples. So uh, the first one is just kind of to have a look at what these, uh, even if they're non-complete, what these metrics actually are. And then actually in one case, even the incomplete metrics can be used for something. Just, just, just the existence can be, can be used for something. So, um, okay, so, uh, so the first example, let's look in dimension four even, just our singularity is just C2 mod gamma. Right, then basically because the singularity is isolated, basically the twisted construction just produces kind of ALE ends if you want. So kind of formal com formal complete ALE other kind of metrics that are parametrized by some sort of large uh, vector space. So let me just uh, say what this is in an example. So the simplest one, if you take just gamma equal Z2, then sort of the weight here of the action is uh, uh, there's just one, I mean, the deformation space is one dimensional. You're just looking at uh, sections of O4 over P1. And I mean, there's a natural SU2 action coming from rotation on P1. And this can be identified with the reducible representation of uh, SU2 with uh, um, dimension five. So faceless symmetric three by three matrices. So there's hypercalic structure parameterized by any such matrix, but then there's also the action of SU2 is sort of hypercalic rotation. So really the metric depends on two parameters. Uh, the quotient of this by um, SU2. So you basically have a wedge, right? You have three ordered eigenvalues that sum to zero. So the here the origin is of course the cone itself. Then there's this kind of line corresponds to the one parameter family of the Gucci Anson matrix. And all other metrics are incomplete, and, but they are precisely all the, uh, any other metric is incomplete, uh, but is also, Kind of as a trilomorphic action of SO3, like the Gucci Hansen. And these are exactly all the SO3 invariant uh, Habakella metrics in dimension four. Um, they were kind of described by ODEs that were written down and studied by uh, Beninsky. Um, thank you. I think, I mean, you can write all these, solve them explicitly and check explicitly that these metrics are all incomplete, of course, except for the Gucci Hansen ones. And what I really don't understand is, uh, I mean, kind of if you think about constructing a Gucci Hansen via the Gibbon blocking ansatz, then of course you can take any sort of sufficiently decaying harmonic function and stick add it in at infinity to get some ALE end. So, and of ALE and the synthetic to that cone, there's an infinitely many uh, of them. So I'm not so sure what this, uh, well, the special role of this uh, finite dimensional family, um, except for observing in this case that because of Cronheimer's plurality theorem, any, you know that any complete hypercalic matrix is going to be SO3 invariant for sure. So somehow these are some, satisfy some sort of, uh, have a better chance of being complete, even if they aren't, but uh, I'm not sure what this. That's true, that's true. Sure, so Claude was saying, actually the SO3 action in the gimbal doc, the answer is quite uh, mysterious. That's true because you only, and that's the U1 that you see and then the, the SO3 that you don't really see it from the, that description, that is true. Okay, and just a final comment about one situation where you can use the incomplete metrics for something. So if you start with the nilpotent cone of a simple algebra, 
then this Namikawa Poisson deformation is actually the well-known uh, what is it? Briskorn Grothendieck Lodori simultaneous resolution of the adjoint quotient. Uh, so curly x is just the free algebra, and the projection is that projection into the kind of adjoint quotient. So oh. this is the same as uh, T C mod the adjoint action of the group T C. So actually, you can think of a twistle line for any of these twistle spaces that S are just triples of the algebra elements. And now you can use this, uh, in this case, you can use the metric that we produce to actually define hypercat quotients as arbitrary level of the level set of the moment map. So as follows, so if you have a, a hypercat manifold, which is acted upon by the compactly group G by tromorphic uh, in a trom Tramiltonian way, and you fix a triple of the algebra elements that sufficiently generic, then you get uh, one of these spectra curve, right? It, it basically, it's a, it's a, you think of it as a twistle line of one particular twistle space, ZS, uh, determined by the triple. And then you just take the standard hypercalic quotient with the metric that we produced at level zero. And you really want to think of this as the hypercalic quotient of M at the level L1, L2, L3, for example. Uh, at the level of twist of space, each fiber is the holomorphic symplectic uh, quotient of the fiber at the corresponding level set of the complex moment map. Uh, okay, good. So this finishes, finishes my first part. Um, okay. Um, Right, so now I have to decide how to uh, go forward. So I do have slightly less than 20 minutes. Let's, let's try to say something. So, okay, so now we want to think of um, uh, kind of hypercalor metrics that um, generalize some of the properties of ALF, four dimensional ALF spaces. So let's go back to well, first of all, looking at what are these ALF gravitational instant points. There's basically two classes. The simplest one is this uh, ALF spaces of cyclic type, which are explicit and obtained by the Gibbon docking ansatz that uh, just was um, uh, discussed last time. So basically, everything is determined by a harmonic function on some open types in R3. So there's a, a countable. I mean, this is a countable family of examples parameterized by a uh, negative integer k. For each k, you fix k points in R3 uh, and the positive constant m, and you look at this sort of harmonic function, which is just a sum of green function, and then you add this constant, constant m. And um, Right, the role of M is precisely kind of controlling this ALF behavior at infinity in the sense that uh, if you go far off to infinity in R3, then basically this term all decay. And what you're left is basically R3, a circle vibration over R3, where the circle have fiber of um, sort of length two pi over square root of M. So M is controlling this part of this circle. Okay, and then, uh, so these are all explicit. And, uh, and then the other family is a bit more complicated. There's also countably many members. I'm gonna try this, but the negative integer K, but some positions at some points in R3 and uh, positive constant. Um, so these are a bit more mysterious, but here's this one uh, kind of description of this uh, ALF metric of so-called the hydro type in a certain limit. And this is due to uh, physicist Sen, uh, and then made rigorous by Schurz and uh, Bern Schurz and Michael Singer. So, <coughs> so first of all, 
uh, you start with the kind of base case, right. K0, and this is given to you. It's the Akia Hitchin manifold, with some sort of explicit, uh, complete Hadakala metric with a SO3 symmetry and these asymptotic. So at infinity, this looks like we were doing the Gibbons Hawking ansatz with an harmonic function, harmonic function of this form. There's some positive constant, which is the scale parameter. And then it's like we have uh, multiplicity minus four for a, for a kind of, for an app. Um, so this is really only the fine, this is only an asymptotic form for the metric. This is only the fine close to infinity. And really there's a Z2 action we need to caution by, which is a list of the antipodal mass one R3. Okay, and basic sense point is that once you have this V0, you get all the others by some sort of uh, gluing construction, where you start with some Z2 invariant Gibbons arcing metric. So you have a bunch of points, but then you have the origin with uh, this negative weight minus four. Uh, you question by Z2, you get a metric that's uh, sort of only. Uh, positive definite outside of a ball around the origin, uh, but you can complete it by gluing in uh, a copy of the Akia Hitchin manifold. Okay, and Bernd and uh, Michael showed that uh, this, this work makes make sense. Right, so now in uh, higher dimensions, right? So we want to go in the higher dimension. So here it seems the uh, key players are this Gibbons Hawking ansatz and this sort of Akia Hitchin manifold. So think sort of what are high dimensional versions of, of these characters. And uh, for the Gibbons Hawking ansatz, that's all uh, very well uh, understood. And it's this uh, theory of high vectoric uh, uh, metrics that were introduced by uh, Bielaski and Roger and Andrew Danza, and also I should say uh, Goto. Um, so basically we're looking at uh, four n-dimensional Hadakala metrics that have a trilomorphic action of uh, n-dimensional torus. So that's the maximum possible kind of rank of of a torus acting trilomorphically on a four n dimensional Hadakala metric. And uh, okay, if I want to be annoying, but um, it's needed later, um, want to think of the torus as the quotient of some vector space H by a full rank lattice lambda. Okay, and then uh, sort of we have a, a Hadakala moment map, right? And uh, and the um, this basic higher dimensional version of the Gibbons Hawking ansatz says that the manifold M can be completely described in terms of uh, what's happening in this uh, sort of essentially this base of this, this moment map. So instead of points, we now have co-dimension three uh, affine subspaces that are usually called flats uh, that have sort of the special form that essentially normals that are integral elements, elements in the lattice, and of course they're determined by uh, um, how you translate them, they're co-dimension three, so how you translate them, they depend on three parameter, so point in R3. And then uh, instead of a, a, a single positive uh, uh, constant, you actually have a, a Positive definite two by two metrics on the dual of daily algebra H. Um, these are sometimes called the top deformation parameters of the metric. And I mean, the metric is explicit, but really from this picture, let me explain what's happening. So you have this uh, projection down to H star tensor R3, space space. The generic fibers are just this tori, Tn. As you go off to infinity, the story become flatter and flatter with flat metric determined by um, kind of the inverse of this positive definite, definite matrix M. 
And then as you approach uh, sort of these works, if you are outside of these flats and is, if you go towards one flat, then basically the picture is that you get transverse to it, you get the four dimensional uh, Taubnat metric and, uh, and uh, kind of, so there's a circle that's collapsing and the particular circle that collapses is precisely the one in the direction of the normal U. Okay, so, so very clear. Okay, so, uh, but now if you uh, know about the sort of sense description of the hydro uh, LS spaces, then you wonder, um, sort of you imagine this, uh, the hydro version of this hyper theory uh, story, where you uh, have uh, your flats, as in the habitory case, but now you add some additional flats with sort of weight minus four, uh, but you also need for them to be fixed by, each of them to be fixed by involution of two. So there's a picture where there's a kind of two sorts of flats, but there's also a reflection group that's acting, sort of generated by deflection in this red, this minus four, Flats. And if you actually want this uh, group to act on a torus, this must be a crystallographic group. So it's a vile group for some compact big group. Okay, and then sort of this sort of describes some rough asymptotic geometry. And you ask sort of are there Habakkuk metrics that fill in this Habakkuk geometry? Okay, so it turns out that actually this is a class, uh, I mean, it exists, it's an interesting class of uh, Habakkuk metrics. So first of all, there's uh, known examples that fall into this class. These are moduli spaces of monopoles on R3 or monopoles with singularities. They uh, precisely have a expected asymptotic geometry that looks like this. Uh, but then also there seems to be a very close relation with uh, kind of things that physicists and geometric representation theorists are particularly interested in uh, sort of these Coulomb branches of three-dimensional uh, supersymmetric Yamnitz theory with n equal four supersymmetries. So there's a quantum gauge theory in physics, which I think um, uh, it's not based on current rules of mathematics, but uh, um, there's a modular space of vacua for this theory, which is expected to be a Habakkuk manifold, and that still exists. And uh, for these three dimensional theories, um, there's in certain regime, this, uh, this um, uh, uh, modular space, a certain component of this modular space of vacua is precisely expected to have be one of these dihedral QLF metrics. So in physics, um, what you need is a, a compact Lie, for, for the quantum gauge theory, you need a compact Lie group together with a representation. And uh, sort of you get the configuration, the W invariant configuration of flats by taking the weights of this representation. And you need to be a little bit careful about lattices and their dual to kind of understand exactly whether, well, whatever. Um, so, uh, right, and then, so this is how you construct the, the original things and then even this parameter and that I had as a meaning in physics is the gauge coupling constant for the quantum theory. And uh, right, and this description of the asymptotic geometry is sort of the limit where these particularly meaningful in the limit where this gauge coupling constant is very large, meaning that this torus fiber is very collapsed. Um, and that's precisely describing the kind of asymptotic geometry of these spaces. And now there's uh, some recent uh, kind of breakthrough by Braverman, Pinkerberg and Nakajima that sort of define some rigorous, have a rigorous definition of some holomorphic uh, symplectic affine varieties that are supposed to be these uh, uh, Coulomb branches um, that should support this uh, Habakkuk matrix. 
Okay, so uh, right, so we're we're uh, Roger sort of we uh, sort of have a, a conjectural uh, suggestion that uh, uh, to produce kind of a definition of a holomorphic symplectic varieties, also a twister space, uh, but we're lacking the twister line in general, except in many cases we can reduce also reduce the existence of twister line by Nam's equation. So in the last five minutes, let me try to quickly explain that. So, um, right, so the holomorphic symplectic structure goes by a kind of relation with Hilbert scheme, or Habakkuk geometry and Hilbert scheme. That's a very well-known and rich story that goes back to the result of Beauville from the 80s that says that if you start with a holomorphic symplectic surface, uh, you look at the uh, Hilbert scheme of points on the surface, then that carries a natural holomorphic symplectic structure. So for example, if you start with a K3 surface, you get the higher dimensional families of the families, I mean, Bovil's families of higher dimensional Habakella compact manifolds. Now I'll need two slight variation on this uh, theme. So the one is the notion of an invariant Hilbert scheme. So if you have a sort of finite group that acts on your space X, you can consider a certain subspace of the Hilbert scheme of uh, cardinality of W, order W points. So basically, um, so you look at the fixed point, there's a natural W action in the Hilbert scheme just by induced action of the, of the group on X. Uh, you look at the fixed point, in general, this will have multiple, can have multiple components you take the components, that's the closure of the locus of smooth W invariant point. I mean, the point, the closure of the smooth locus. Okay, that's something that's very well known and used in complex geometry and something that's a bit less well known, I think, and was introduced by Atiyah and Hitchin when they were studying uh, monopoles, modular spaces of monopoles, is the notion of a transverse Hilbert scheme. So the situation that they were considering is you have a holomorphic uh, projection down to a complex curve C, then uh, sort of there's an induced map of Hilbert schemes of points. And basically you can define a open subset of the Hilbert scheme that sort of well behaves with respect to this map. So uh, for example, the simple situation, just have two points, you have this projection from the Hilbert scheme of X to the Hilbert scheme of the curve, which is just a symmetric product. And this transverse Hilbert scheme is just the regular part of this uh, map. I mean, the point, the union of the open sets where the, of points where the map is regular. Okay, so, uh, so with Roger, what we uh, propose to do is, uh, so first of all, we have this observation that now if you start with a holomorphic symplectic manifold, um, of higher, uh, any dimension. In general, the Hilbert scheme is not going to be holomorphic symplectic, but if you have a symplectic action of a reflection group, then you can consider this uh, invariant Hilbert scheme. Uh, that's going to be uh, holomorphic symplectic. Basically, the, um, uh, I mean, as in Beauville, you only have to worry about two points coming together and um, the double invariance of the fact that you have a, the reflection groups is basically, basically forcing point, basically the local picture as two points come together is exactly the one as for complex surfaces. And then if we have a, a W equivalent projection onto a W representation, uh, we also can consider this open sets of transverse invariant Hilbert scheme, which is again, homomorphic symplectic. Now, what we propose to do is to start with our hypertoric manifold with a W invariant collection of flats, and we take this transverse invariant Hilbert scheme uh, uh, where mu is just the holomorphic molar map. And you can actually do this on each fiber of the twister space of your hypertoric manifold. So you automatically get the twister space. And sort of our expectation is that this this uh, Hilbert scheme is the underlying holomorphic symplectic manifold carrying this uh, dihedral ALF metric. So 
um, we can uh, sort of for dimensions you can study this relatively explicitly uh, and in some situation as I said um, one can there's a root a list of proving this by nuns equation so in particular uh, when your hypertoric variety is actually just flat quantum bundle of a torus uh, then basically you relate to a moduli space of Nam's equation on an interval with two poles, two regular poles at the endpoints, and there's very good reason uh, on this uh, route to show that that moduli space has, I mean, definitely has a complete hypercalor metric, and that metric is actually has the expected asymptotic geometry. Okay, I'll stop. With respect to the difficulty of proving completeness in these constructions, it seems to me that the, the main problem is it, it, that if your tangent cone was smooth, mm -hmm. uh, then, then things would go very clearly. You just have to say it's, you, know, you have a compact piece and then a right. piece that's... So have you tried uh, to construct solutions where the tangent cone in infinity is a cone on a free Sasaki? You have lots of smooth creases. Sure, of course. Uh, has, uh, have you tried a construction along those lines? Just wondering so try to uh, apply this to that particular situation and think about what's happening to um, right. because the that's method as you go inside. I, I, I don't, I mean, I. I think you have a very good shot at, at proving uh, completeness abstractly as long as you know that you really do get you know, this asymptotic region where you have the geometry is controlled. And yeah, but I think in that situation, you don't have, you don't know, I mean, here, kind of everything is sort of controlled at infinity, but it's not controlled as you go in. And in general, you don't even have a guess for what this, I mean, you don't have a space, you don't a priori have a space where this metric is defined, right? Well, you certainly have a singular cone. The question is, what, what do you do for a reference resolution? Right, so you would want to start for a resolution, but I think in, uh, complex geometry, there's this conjecture that the only isolated uh, symplectic singularity that has a symplectic resolution is uh, um, the one, the minimal uh, Milpoden orbit for AM type the algebra. Um, is, is there good I think there is. I don't. I don't remember anymore. What? What? Where's that coming from? Um, I don't remember. The, 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 the motivation for the, the the question is that just in looking at the ordinary Sasaki Sasaki Einstein case rather than the free Sasaki sure. case. Um, and covering the same uh, to, you know, produce a lot of examples along that, that, that Right, but somehow you start from, I mean, you know, in a, I mean, you, 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 I, I mean, I know, of course, but you, uh, in that situation, you have a resolution and you start from the resolution and then, right, then kind of you try to solve um, complex Mongean pair equation and then the problem, sure, is control thing. I mean, you're now in an uncompact situation, so you want to control things at infinity, but. I mean, here it's like you have something well defined at infinity, and then a priori we don't even have a space right there. Are there any further questions in the audience here? Oh, yes, Mark. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, so you have this tangent cone at infinity, mm -hmm. and then you, you somehow, it's important in your construction that it occurs in a holomorphic family as a central fiber of a deformation, right? Right. Well, is, it, um, is, is it, uh, you know, what, what, what is the reason that, that it, 
that it can be put into this holomorphic family. And you know, you might expect that there's only a sector that you can approach the central fiber only in one sector, but you seem to have it in an entire disk. For example, if you think about uh, 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 non-compact Calabi-Yau manifolds, right. it seems unusual that you would have a singular fiber surrounded in, by a holomorphic family of these uh, spaces. I'm just wondering if you have any comment about how how the how the normal cone or sorry how the tangent cone is situated in this family. But what do you mean? I mean, um, I guess I mean. Also here, sort of when you, for the um, kind of in this situation where you have a symplectic resolution, I mean, kind of, or even in the examples, right, they exist. Yeah. Actually. Um, I mean, there's still, you need to remove, you need to remove certain uh, uh, kind of, if you think about parameters for the Habakkuk structures, could I mention three sets that pass through the, and subspaces that pass through the origin that will correspond to singular Oh, this is uh, these yeah. these are subsets in the space of holomorphic sections of this uh, right. twisted yeah. bond. Uh, oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. So so zero is is uh, what's the behavior near zero? There's a whole bunch of. There's going to be. I mean, in that. I mean, in the example, right? You have basically basically you have this H. I mean, in this case, you have H two tensor R three. So if you think about uh -huh. the Habakkuk things, and then you have this action of this uh, vial. Namikawa value group. Uh -huh. And then basically you have this column mentioned three subspaces that are points with non-trivial stabilizers inside this. Uh -huh. I see. And that would correspond to singular uh, metric. I see. And then the smooth ones are going to be in, in the I see. Okay, complement. Thank you. Any more questions here or out there? No, so then thank you very much for the talk and it's